So I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, this uh, Art for the Ocean uh, webinar, which is part of the United Nations uh, World Oceans Week. My name is Stuart Jeffrey. I'm a, a, a reader uh, at Glasgow School of Art. Uh, I'm also co-director of the One Ocean Hub project, which is a project that's put this webinar and a series of other webinars together. And I will be co-chairing today's webinar. Uh, I'll be co-chairing it with uh, Lisa MacDonald, who is a, a curator of uh, Pacific Art and Culture, who has recently joined One Ocean Hub as a research associate. So Lisa will be looking after the question and answer session uh, towards the end of this uh, webinar. So clearly the, the idea of, the, of this webinar is to look at the, uh, or really to explore uh, the role that art and all its forms has uh, to play uh, around global decisions and an integrated and inclusive global governance. So creative practices uh, offer opportunities to share multiple conceptions and values of the sea, providing an outlet for groups that are often underrepresented in conventional approaches to ocean science and management. So to that end, we've got a really fantastic uh, panel of internationally recognized uh, artists and representations from South Africa, Canada, West Papua, uh, and uh, 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 New Zealand. Uh, and we're, the idea is that, we, that we'll have a, a series of short presentations from each of the artists who will introduce themselves and they'll tell you a little bit uh, uh, about their work, uh, specifically as it relates to oceans. Uh, and then at the end of the four short presentations, we'll draw everybody, we'll reconvene back together uh, as a panel. And that's the opportunity for our attendees to uh, ask the panel uh, the, the, the burning questions. And we have uh, a way of doing that. If you look down at the bottom of your uh, screen as participants, you'll see there's a little button marked Q&A. Uh, if you can save all your questions uh, towards the end. So we won't take individual questions after each artist. We'll have questions as a, as a panel, as a whole. So if you put in your questions to the Q&A, uh, if they're for a specific artist, if you could mention that artist so we know who to, who to direct it to, or if it's for everybody, that would also be, be fine. Um, clearly, uh, there's quite a number of participants in this uh, 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 webinar. So hopefully, we're expecting some really uh, exciting and interesting questions. But we're going to try and get through as many of these as we possibly can live uh, within the, the hour. We've only got an hour for this session. But if uh, at the end of the session, everybody will get a chance to uh, participate in an evaluation procedure. And that evaluation procedure will give you another opportunity to forward on to us any questions. And we'll try to deal with them uh, after, um, after the event. Also, it's worth mentioning, uh, on, if you press the chat button at the bottom of your uh, uh, screen, you'll see a little chat window comes up. And this is a nice opportunity for everybody to uh, introduce themselves and to chat. Uh, and these are myself and other panelists, so we'll try and get back to uh, 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 engage with people via that chat window as well. So I think the best thing to do is to start with our uh, first panelist, and this is uh, uh, Michael Nicole uh, Yagulanis, who's joining us from, from Canada. So Michael has a, a long and illustrious career and is, has worked in a huge range of uh, artistic media. We have uh, sculpture, very successful Haida manga books, murals, murals, and even uh, opera librettos. So there's a, there's, a, there's a lot to get our teeth into there. As I say, Michael's joining us from Canada, uh, and I think we're ready to go with our first presentation now. Good. Well, good morning, um, fellow panelists and hosts. And uh, my goodness, uh, almost 100 participants scattered all around the globe. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be able to reach out to you from my little COVID isolated studio here on the west coast of Canada. Um, the before I give my brief presentation. I just want to say that uh, uh, the diversity of, of work that I do is, is, a, is a bit unusual 
And most of the work that comes from my community, an indigenous nation called Haida, off the west coast of Canada and just a, a little bit south of Alaska in the North Pacific. And most of the work that we do, as you can see in the background, this uh, large paper cast I took off a totem pole is of a beaver, and that is the more classic form. My uh, particular studio work is more interested in, in finding a space somewhere in between. And by in between, I mean taking the material culture or the intellectual property that is this Haida and speaking to the other, which is not Haida, but trying to find a way to explain sort of the complexity of notions of cosmology and design features that we use. And in order to do that, I started to play with a new genre of, of of art expression, I suppose, called Haida Manga, which is, um, as it suggests, a graphic um, a comic book, if you will, uh, literature. And so we're going to see some images from that work. We're not going to see much in the way of the sculptural work I do. And obviously, I'm not going to start singing from the libretto for Flight of the Hummingbird, so your ears will be safe. I'm going to um, turn off my video now and we're going to run some of these images. It'll be about six minutes. And thank you very much, everyone, for uh, stepping in and, and giving us uh, freely of your time. <clears throat> So um, I'm going to um, I'm going to tell you a story actually, um, and then you'll figure out what the story means. Uh, that's that's the best role for the observer. It turns you from an observer into a participant. Although my indulgences have taken me to places far from the ocean, I still live in the North Pacific, on an island. My childhood home was on the shores of a tidal slough called Delcathli. The slough is attached to an inlet that reaches out away from the Canadian continent far to the east and stretches its tidal hand northward to its Alaskan neighbor. Our house was perched on wooden pilings driven amongst the dune grasses and into shoreline gravels. The highest tides would cover the blue-green dune grass, and when pushed onward by the southeast winds, the narrow space under my bedroom floor became part of the ocean. The seemingly dry shoreline revealed its inconsistency and was occupied by the flexed muscle of the Pacific, a clear cold water that covered my dry land footprints and swept away the detritus of my youth. The low tides, when the Pacific retreated, or perhaps it was when the land advanced, both exposed the deep black muck of the eelgrass sea meadows. At the lowest tide, a small bulging ring of water fringed by a mat of eelgrass was revealed. It is an eye peering out from amongst strands of green hair. Even under the gray land skies of these temperate rainforests, the spring water sparkles. Its surface is a reflection. It is a dancing pulse of water celebrating an escape from out under the burden of land. It is released. Its waters liberated into the ocean. <clears throat> this child cautiously sipped from the spring. It wasn't the taste that was exotic. After all, this was the same water that filled our household well only 40 meters upland. The adventure was imagining the fish, the segmented sea worms and other sea creatures that would soon also come to taste the sweetness of fresh water. The regularity of these tides seems polite. You can rely on the good manners of the sea to step back from its land claim or for the land to lift its skirts to accommodate the sweep of waves. They do this with an almost comedic touch, one leaving before its competitor arrives, all to avoid the embarrassment of overstaying a welcome or overshadowing the next guest. We know of one time when this politeness gave way. Haidas had just finished carving the first ever totem pole which itself was a gift first seen in the green, shallow ocean waters. The canoe paused as everyone leaned over to admire and memorize the forms stretched out along the ocean floor. 
These are the shapes we now recognize as unique to this region, compressed circles, undulating ribbons and muscular forms expressed as totem poles, tattoos, carvings, weavings, paintings, and Haida Manga. When that canoe arrived back in Dalkathli, it was towing a cedar log purchased from the neighboring town of Yan. Those marine shapes were carved into the log, which was raised along the shoreline facing the ocean. And then something peculiar happened. The tide became insistent. It slowly rose up, but it refused to stop. A thin sheet of water pushed forward over the dune grass and pressed on by its very depth entered the doorways. Canoes once resting on the beach, now agitated, pushed up against the houses. Everyone scrambled to load the canoe with possessions and as the tide rose, the surrounding lowlands were covered. Headlands and beaches were submerging. Growing swells now stepped through the coastal forests, advancing over muskegs and villages. Canoes gathered alongside a hillside. They watched as the summit began to disappear underwater. Lines, first tied to the branches, were then tied to treetops and finally became anchor lines stretching downward to the drowned forest. Canoes reared up and raced down in ocean swells filled with panicking land animals. Desperate bears flung themselves against canoes. Any canoe that carried a weaver and her small dogs were spared. Others overturned. The canoes clung to the thin thread of anchor line for days and nights. When the ocean finally abandoned the islands, all the fresh water was gone. Streams, rivers, and lakes now ran salty. Many people and animals perished. And then someone found a tiny ring of fresh water amongst a sea meadow. Haida's see our lives beginning along a thread that runs up from the ocean depths through tidal lands and into the doorway of a house. The doorway is our birth moment, and the distance of the thread running towards the back wall of the house is our life. At the center point is a pit, a fire pit, which is a nexus for another thread that runs at 90 degrees left and right towards the houses of other humans. The fire pit also marks the intersection of a vertical thread that rises up in the smoke and straight down underneath the fire. Above our house are the fire pits, the houses, and the lives of other sentient non-human beings. There are also such fire pits, houses, and lives of other beings below us. These vertically stacked levels are all linked by this central thread, and together it forms a comprehensive grid for all beings. These simultaneous existences also appear to be anchored to the same one deep ocean waters outside your own birthing door. The selection of images that has accompanied this presentation are all taken from my studio practice, which is itself only the expression of a child sipping fresh water from an ocean spring. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. That was, uh, that was fantastic, really uh, uh, inspiring and enlightening. Really enjoyed that very much. So uh, uh, in order to keep us to time, to give us as much uh, time as we possibly can for questions at the end, I hope people are putting questions into the, the Q&A box. We're going to move straight on to our next panellist, who is Rose Boswell, who is uh, joining us from uh, South Africa. She, Rose is a, is a poet and an anthropologist. Um, and she's also a professor of ocean cultures and heritage at Nelson Mandela University. Uh, and I'm glad to see a, a, a colleague of ours in the, the, the One Ocean Hub project as well. So Rose, whenever you're ready, please go. Thank you very much, uh, Stuart. Um, and welcome to everyone. Um, 
I'm here in South Africa, it's getting increasingly cold as, as winter is setting in. And I'd like to share some thoughts um, today about my work that is sort of spanning across the disciplinary boundaries. Um, I'm first an anthropologist, that is my first and foremost discipline. But in the last three years, um, my work has stretched to encompass uh, poetry and it came to me quite, uh, quite by chance. Uh, I started writing um, and I realized that the words that were coming out from the text in front of me did not wish to conform to the ethnographic style, especially the style that had been taught to me and that had been passed down from one generation of, of, of anthropologists to the other. But first, a little bit of background about myself. Um, I was born in Mauritius, a little island in the southwest Indian Ocean region. I'm of slave descent, of African descent. Uh, we are part of the people known as the Creoles in Mauritius. But I did not spend much time on the island in my birth. I grew up in Africa, in Malawi, in a very rural area at the very southern tip of the Great Rift Valley. And it is there that I learned uh, and I saw just how uh, different, you know, uh, lives were, how uh, disaster in, 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 a, in a moment could obliterate, you know, a community or a family. And um, I became interested in, in learning about local communities and I wanted to know more about how people survive, how they become resilient uh, under conditions of, of duress. And beyond this, of course, I mean, like most uh, 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 pupils of, of my day, I had the, 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 the blessing of being able to attend a, a, a multicultural school. I was, I was fortunate in that regard. And there I, I encountered poetry, but of course it was English uh, poetry at the time, informed by the imperatives of the day. Um, and my work has expanded beyond that because I now also write not only in English, but I also write in Creole, which is the lingua franca or the, the main language uh, that is spoken on the island of Mauritius, or at least it is spoken by almost all in common parlance. So when I came to South Africa in the early 1990s, um, I was thrust into an, an academic world where I was expected to write in a particular way. And uh, in that space, um, there wasn't much room for, for um, artistic or aesthetic uh, uh, expression, especially at the time. We were encouraged to write in a very formalized way about our seemingly objective findings that we, we obtain in, in, in the research field. And it is only much later on in my career that on the side, in my field notebooks, I started to jot down sentiments, feelings about how it was to be um, in local communities that I had no idea about, what it was like to experience um, scent or aroma as a predominant way of being in the world as opposed to sight and sound. Um, and in that space, I then began to sort of quietly write, write down my thoughts and my, and my feelings um, with regard to what I, was what I was experiencing in that particular moment, which is something that early ethnography or early anthropological writing did not allow us to do. It did not allow us to fully express our, our emotions. And this is something that is coming to the force now. Um, and so what does poetry do for me beyond uh, uh, allowing me to stretch the, the ethnographic boundary? Poetry actually allows me to slow down and to reflect on the moment. Um, there was very famous, uh, a very famous anthropologist, Thomas Helen Erickson, has written about uh, the concept or the experience of overheating in the time of modernity, that um, we are living through acceleration, the acceleration of acceleration. In other words, life is moving much, much faster than what we can potentially uh, uh, understand and, and hold on to. And poetry for me allows me to slow down, it allows me to reflect, it allows me to be in the moment. And why have I chosen the, the oceanic theme? I've chosen the oceanic theme because I realized that the oceans are, are not just important to, to policy makers and to those interested in, in oceans governance. The oceans are important to ordinary human beings who across the cultural spectrum experience it in fundamentally 
powerful ways. So for example, we have metaphors of the, of the, of the tides. We have uh, particularly embodied experiences, uh, sensory experiences. We, 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 um, we express all of our senses when we are in connection with, with the sea. Um, for us, the sea is also memory. It's about nostalgia, about remembering the past, especially for those who are historically uh, disconnected from the oceans and the sea, or for whom the sea has historical and political significance. I mean, being a, a, a slave descended person, for example, I'm always intrigued by the narratives that emerge around the sea, the painful memories that emerge around the sea, but also memories of of what it is like to be sustained by the sea. So fishing folk, for example, have very powerful narratives of what it is like to be sustained by the sea, to rely on the tides, to read the ocean and to read the weather. So all of these ideas and concepts uh, became very interesting to me and I wanted to render it in a completely different form. And that form is poetry. So I'm going to ask Stuart to, um, if you could please play my little slides in which I will show um, you some of the photographs that I've taken in my field research in different parts of the world. And also, the, I will uh, recite some of the poetry. So I apologize if the sound is not perfect, um, but maybe at some other point, I'll get the opportunity. Grounding. To... Ground yourself, they say. Don't be so unsettled. However, they don't ask, were you born on sea? Did the sea teach you how to be? Did the ocean teach you its vastness, its boundlessness? Did the fish show you their diversity, their mutability? Or are you like the monsoon that waxes with the seasons? Do you yearn for the deepest blue of the oceans, that unfathomable color of stillness? No one understands when they say that you should ground yourself. They do not understand that you are not of land, but of sea that tide. I've known that tide since I was a boy. That tide, it knows me. I rise in the morning to greet it. It rises with the sun to greet me. It pushes my fish to the surface. They dance and cleave to my hook. I'm a lucky fisherman from the island of joy. I am poor, they say. I am old. But me, I still have that tide. And I I'm still a boy. Breaking. My heart is breaking as I remember the sight of the shore, as I remember ground giving way to my toes in ice cream sand. My heart is breaking as I remember small, dark pools, tiny eddies of briny sea ebbing away. My heart is breaking for salty air as I remember the wind on my face my heart is breaking as I remember children rolling in water, surfers carrying boards like prized trophies. I thought my heart was breaking like the waves upon the, on the pier, but now I see it is me. Thank you very much for that, Stuart. So that is just a selection of, of my poetry. Um, and um, I have one, one book out. I mean, obviously I can't self-promote here, but you can find the book um, online. Um, and um, I'm hoping to produce a, a whole new anthology that specifically um, responds to and, and focuses on the oceans and one's uh, engagement uh, with the sea in, in the poetic sense. So I'm looking forward to the questions um, and uh, thank you very much. So I'm just gonna hand back to Stuart. Thank you very much for all that was said. That was fantastic, a really beautiful, beautiful film there, uh, and uh, some beautiful poetry in association with it. So, uh, moving moving straight on to our third panelist, uh, we're very lucky to be joined by Ronnie Kareni, uh, who's a West Papuan uh, musician uh, and activist, although has been in, in Australia for the last ten years, uh, and is actually joining us from uh, Australia this evening. So, thank you very much, Ronnie. I know it's about one o'clock in the morning there. Very much appreciated uh, that you're joining us. You, you're, you're on mute at the moment, uh, Ronnie, but uh, whenever you're ready uh, to share screen, on you go. Mahikai, 
Wow, 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 wow. Cease and greetings to everyone, wherever you are. Um, it's early hours in the morning here. Good morning. Um, and also good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, it's a privilege and honor to be able to join with some of the amazing creative practitioners. And thank you, uh, Stuart, as well as the One Ocean Hub for this amazing session that really speaks about the people and the connection to our ocean, to our land. And coming from the Southern Pacific and West Papua is where I come from. Um, it's the Western end of the Pacific Ocean makes up one third of the ocean in the world. And it is an amazing times where we're living and facing um, the challenges in this uh, part of the world with the climate change. And yet, here in the Pacific, we the people remain resilient and still uh, connect to the roots. And this is where I wanted to share with you um, of um, the role of music, especially the significance of it and why we continue to sing the songs that is in sync with the land and the ocean. So I will go into uh, by um, going through a bit of my PowerPoint slides and finish with a bit of uh, just the footage of what I do through music in echoing the voice, the aspiration, and the connection with the land and ocean. So for now, I will um, take myself out and I'll share with you the PowerPoint. So in a moment. So I would like to begin by saying in what many of my people, we regard the land that we live is not because we're born into it, but because we as a person, as a Papua, the land was born with us. And for me, as a Papuan, the land, the Papua land was born in me. And that is my right, my sovereignty, my identity, and it's who I am within the region, within the place that I live. And as a Papuan, land, the ocean is life. Apeli Haofa, one of Pacific anthropologists, in his book, he made reference to many of the Pacific islands is that we are the ocean. In quoting one of his uh, paragraph from the book, we are the ocean, and I quote, just as the sea is an open and ever flowing reality, so should our oceanic identities transcend all forms of insularity to become one that is openly searching, inventive, and welcoming. As you can see through this slide, the Tetol, where I come from, Tetol is my totem. It's where the reincarnation, the connection with the ancestors, where the law, L-O-R-E, has passed down from generations to generations of how much we're connected with the ocean and the people that have to have that duty to protect and to guide. And it reminds me of the significance and resilience of the ocean, of where I come from, of where you come from. It transcends all forms of insularity. As you can see on this map there, there's the western end. It's it's the western end that we, there's a town called Sorong. And on the eastern 
and to the south, it's Samurai. And my role as a musician is where reviving and sustaining that culture, the practices that we, our ancestors have practiced over the years, over 40,000 years. It's continuing that culture, the song lines, the kinship, and on the North Coast, when you travel from that Western end down to the South end, and we paddle, we canoeing through those coastlines with our songs and dance and celebration. But in West Papua at this very stage, those cultural practices does not continue due to colonization and due to the outside influence that came upon to force the people, my people, to adopt these other practices. Yet, through our songs, the dance, we continue to maintain that and adapt into the evolving society we're living in. And growing up in West Papua, I born in Papua, but due to the colonization, the suppression, uh, my family fled across from the Western end to the Eastern end in Papua New Guinea, where I grew up most of my life there. But the cultural practice was in me because the Papua was born in me. And until this day, I continue to carry the voice, the aspiration of my people through the drum in which it is my weapon of choice, where I use the drum to beat and calling for others to hear and also beat to the same rhythm. And the more you hear that, the louder it becomes. And that is um, the role of music that I use in advocacy, as well as within the, the band I perform with, which we use the word sorong samurai. It's about the land and the ocean we share. And basically um, to keep that rhythm the voice of our ancestors continues to beat in our everyday life, in our music, but also in sharing with people. Sing Sing or the songs and dance are very significant in our, in our culture, in, in, in the Pacific and many other cultures, where that is where the history is passed on. So I learned through the sing sing ceremony, the rituals, and that is makes the what it significant of music um, that we play and perform and advocate um, by sharing that. So it's sharing our struggle through the songs. So the message is in the song, and the song is also speaking about the struggle. Over the years, as I came to Australia and live here, study here, music has become that vehicle for me and few of my friends um, joining force with a lot of my First Nation brothers and sisters here in Australia and rallying together in solidarity, in addressing the very problems that is systemat in system systemic ways institutionally has suppressed the voice of the marginalized, has suppressed those who are trying to speak for their right. As we know what is happening around the world with uprising, people relate to the systemic racism and so music has been that vehicle for us my people and those who i'm engaging to continue 
to advocate. And it brings together the uniqueness as well, as we, pro while we promote the music and perform, but at the same time, it's about our self-determination, the, the culture, the music, the significance of the rituals, the ceremonies, where it's important to be, um, some can be played whether in public, but there are some of the ceremonies that we don't play in public and maintaining that as well. And at the same time, it's about sharing who we are with those who also have the culture, the, the richness of their culture and sharing that and no understanding that our cultures are unique in their own ways and their own rights. And so for me, um, music has been that um, the significant part to really um, carry the voice of my people, the cries of my people, but at the same time celebrating the richness, the uniqueness of, our, of the, the, the culture. And so with my um, band and the group we perform, um, it's Sorong Samurai, we continue to use our music in a way that is about who we are. But at the same time, it's our right, indigenous right, of uh, the people of the land that this cannot be copyrighted or it cannot be used to play at another place or by someone else and con continues to really show who we are. And so I want to share with you a, a footage here towards the end about how we are connected with the ocean and listening to the sounds of the ocean and, and also playing with that sound and at the same time vibing with that, the sound as well as maintaining the significance of that sound. And so this is one of the songs that speaks about celebrating our culture through connecting with the sounds from the ocean. And this is called Suk Suk, yeah. That brings me to, to the end of my uh, presentation, but I um, just want to say thank you. And that was our performance uh, from Melbourne 2017. Thank, and I'll, I'll pass it on to Stuart because I just have to work out there. <laughs> Thank, thank you very much, Ronnie. That that was uh, that was uh, really uh, illuminating, enlightening, 
uh, as well as inspiring. And also, actually, uh, I just it's um, it's, a, it's a reminder of what we're missing right now when we're in when we're in lockdown. That's that's the closest I've been to a kind of a, a crowd in a cultural event for the last few months. So that's slightly slightly worrying too. Okay, so uh, we're 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 probably a little bit behind time. So I'm going to move straight on to our final panelist, uh, who is George Nuku. We're really pleased to welcome him. Uh, so George Nuku is a Maori artist. He's been working for for 33 years, it says here, in an amazing uh, range of materials: stone, bone, wood, shell, polystyrene, and plexiglass as well. And he's uh, he's for the past six years as an installation. Bottled Ocean has been touring around the world and he's been presenting and collaborating with uh, institutions uh, and communities. So really pleased to welcome uh, uh, George, who, who actually is joining us from Paris, which is... <laughs> Thank you. Tēnā koutou katoa, everybody. Uh, I'm George Nuku, and yes, I'm a, I'm a Māori artist of... Uh, also of Scot and German descent. I'm 56 years old. I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, as, as Stuart explained briefly, uh, I started off uh, carving, carving the, the so-called traditional things of wood and stones and bone and shell. And uh, I come from a generation of people who, uh, who, who, who discovered their, 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 their Māori identity in an intense way through the arts. And we were all fueled by this kind of desire to uh, really try to connect uh, as closely as we could uh, to our ancestors. A lot of this was motivated by the reality that we were in a society in New Zealand where we were told to assimilate or die to the, to the dominant way, uh, to the New Zealand way. And so in, in this time, I, I, I am humbled to say I, I've contributed to the, 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 the revival and the restoration of many of our art forms of tattooing, of tamoko, tamupuro, of music, and uh, in my own way, in my, my own journey I've made through art. And I salute uh, the aunties and the grandmothers who, uh, re who, who made the stand and revived uh, our Māori language and kept it from the, uh, from the precipice. So what happened to me was, um, I, I came to, the, I'll just be really brief. I came to the UK in 2006 with a group of artists from my country. And we, we, uh, we were in a seminal uh, exhibition called Pacifica Styles in the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology in the, in the uh, University of Cambridge in the UK. And, and we, made, we, we were all uh, seasoned artists. And we, we, uh, we, we, we entered into the museums and we started interacting directly with the museums. I, 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 to me, it wasn't a really a problem because I, I've been carving the ancestral images all my life. So, so being in an ethnographic situation was not really a shock for me. Uh, things, things took a turn and then I, I became kind of like, I described myself as the, um, the, the Brad Pitt of ethnographic museums because uh, I was getting gigs every, in every ethnographic museum on the UK and, and starting into Europe, I was... I was in. I was in getting all these invites and to participate in the shows because of my ability to carve plexiglass and and respond and integrate with the ethnographic collections of Māori culture. After a while, though, uh, six years ago, in fact, I, I took my, my my life took a turn and uh, I started having uh, visions and dreams about things and. And at the same time, I watched uh, this B grade movie. Uh, at this stage, I was living in in France. And in France, B-grade B movies have kind of cult status. They're not looked down on. They, they, they seem to enjoy them in a different way to anglo wise. And one of these B-grade movies was this film, uh, Water World, starring uh, Kevin Costner, which is considered a not a very good film in, uh, amongst um, anglophone, anglophone audiences. But the French adore this film. And I watched it again anyway. And uh, it was interesting about this guy called Marina, who was... Um, he, 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 tra he traverses this flooded planet where the ice polar caps have melted because of mismanagement of the planet by humans. And he traverses the, the, the planet in his waka, his canoe, made out of 
spare parts of metal of the former, former world. And he's a mutant in that he can survive under the water and above the water. And he's a kind of an anti-hero, and I relate to that. And anyway, he has interaction with people who live on these things called atolls. And they, they, they're kind of made of junk, bits and pieces. And the people live on these atolls. And he goes and sees them once in a while and trades with them. And what, what separated him from the people on the atolls was that the people on the atolls were clinging to the life before, when there was land. And the people on the atolls were, weren't able to, to, to change or adapt to, to the new world. So he, he, he said to them, you, you're dead already. And so this had a profound effect on me, this film, because it was talking about the future, but in fact, it was speaking about right now. It was speaking about our, 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 our inability to change. And it was speaking about our fear of mutation. And as, as the, the Mariner character was uh, persecuted for being a mutant. As, 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 a, as a kind of mutant myself, a mixture of all these different cultures, and get, you put them in the mix and you get George. I, uh, <clears throat> I, I, I understood this idea a lot. And so I started, to, um, I started to draw ocean creatures and I started to produce ocean creatures as, as illustrations. And then one day I looked at some plastic bottles and I, I could see uh, whales and sharks and, and all kinds of creatures. And so it led me down this path of creating uh, my first installation of bottled ocean, which I, I created for uh, the Indigenous Peoples uh, Found, Found Federation in, uh, at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Taipei, Taiwan. I was invited there to, to show with other Indigenous artists from Taiwan. And so I, so I was able to, I was, no longer, I'm, I was no longer just responding to ethnographic objects, to, to Māori, Tonga and museums. I was presenting a whole new standalone idea called Bottled Ocean. And then it, it, it traveled from, the idea grew and grew with each successive showing and, uh, and, <clears throat> and more mutated creatures became, came, came uh, added to the mix. And, and what, what I, I, I don't really wanna to talk too much about that. I wanna to get to the point of my of speaking right now and that through all this, I, I, uh, I, I, have, I have managed to catch uh, a glimpse of uh, the nature of plastic itself. Oh, and Māori, we call this Māori. It's life essence, and it's enabled me to have a glimpse of it after all these years of, of working it, and and it's to, it's 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 uh, told told me uh, many things and showed me many things about about the world I'm in, and uh, I and I say now that um, firstly I say to people uh, I don't worry uh, it it will be traditional by this afternoon, and uh, and and to that now I I say to you all that uh, that in fact the uh, the plastic is is proof of divinity. When you see the plastic, uh, as you see in my images, you, uh, uh, you, you, you can't help but not sense the presence of uh, light and water when you see a plastic bottle. And uh, as we all know, uh, light and water uh, is the source of life itself. And, and so if the plastic is divine in that sense, and of course it's divine because the plastic is coming from petroleum and oil and the plastic therefore comes from our mother. Therefore, the plastic is uh, related to us in a genealogical uh, matrix. And the plastic is probably the oldest thing uh, we, we ever hold in our hand. And therefore, the plastic is uh, an, an ancestor to us. Therefore, we should treat our elders with more respect than we do. As the baby of the family, we should treat the older members of our family with much more respect. And so you have this thing that's millions of years old. It's very old. This plastic, and yet, as as <clears throat> as well as being the oldest thing in the world, it's also the newest thing in the world. Like uh, like the young people. So you've got this thing where it's the oldest and the newest in the same breath, and I say that perhaps between those two things we can discover some truths, some uh, and perhaps the the, the plastic uh, can uh, give us some lessons, and perhaps the plastic can save us. And so uh, from this, I, 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 think I discover that the, the pollution is sacred. Yeah, it's sacred. As the plastic is sacred. Because all is sacred. You can't, you can't say that that child is more sacred than that child. You cannot say that. You cannot say, uh, I love my kids, but I don't really love those kids over there. 
it's evil to say that and think that. And it's the same for, for this, uh, this incredible material of plastic. That, that, that is causing death. But the plastic doesn't throw itself in the ocean, as we all know. We do that. One way we could say, uh, how can we stop the plastic from getting into the ocean? Well, perhaps we, uh, perhaps we took this plastic bottle here and we said, uh, okay, guys, uh, you see this plastic bottle? It's worth 10,000 euros. Oh, I'm going to hold on to it like this now. I'm going to look after it because it's worth 10,000 euros. I'm going to put it away somewhere safe. I'm probably going to pay some people to guard it. Well, I say that there's other ways to um, measure, measure value than just money. And uh, one of the things I do is I try to uh, show things uh, in, in their beauty because uh, beauty is something so universal to us all. And perhaps by, make, by showing the beauty of this plastic, uh, that, it, that uh, it's so beautiful that we can't take our eyes away from it. Just like we can't take our eyes away from a beautiful man or a beautiful woman, or we can't take our eyes away from a diamond ring or, or a Ferrari car, and yet we can turn our back on the pollution and we look away from it in disgust and abhorrence. And so I'm in the business of making that 180 degree turn and flipping the view right around so that it's something that we can't take our eyes off, that our eyes go back to it and our eyes go back to it and our eyes go back to it all the time. And perhaps in that, we can see uh, uh, some, ourselves in the plastic. We can definitely look through the plastic and see each other refracted and reflected. And at the same time, we, we can see uh, ourselves in it. We can see a bit of ourselves in every one of the thousands and thousands of plastic bottles that I use in my installations. We, um, yeah, I'm a smart guy. I'm using something that there's plenty of around. One million bottles are, are produced every day in the world, every minute, sorry. One million bottles per minute. So I don't lack for material. And there's uh, so many artists in the world. <clears throat> and there's so many uh, willing uh, people who want to uh, make some visions with their hands and participate and be a part of something. So, so yeah, uh, we, we, we shouldn't really have a problem with all this stuff lying around, all this plastic in the ocean. We are... Uh, we can turn it into treasure that it really is. Okay, that's me. Thank you, guys. Thank you, George. Thank you very much indeed. That's a really uh, uh, astonishing way of reorientating our way of, uh, of thinking about plastic. So thank you very much for that. Uh, really insightful uh, uh, approach. Fascinating. And uh, I think, unfortunately, we may not have as much time for questions as we had hoped, and the questions are already racking up. So if, if all the panellists could uh, could restart their cameras, I'm going to pass over to Lisa, who we maybe got five or six minutes for some questions. I know some great questions come in, uh, but thanks again, George. Lisa, you're on mute. Oh, I'm here, I'm here. Uh, so we have a great question that's coming from uh, Iuli. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. Um, and it's a question for the whole panel, and I know we don't have much time, so it's probably a good, good, good question to end on in a way. Uh, but basically the question is, uh, you know, how can we take discussions like we're having today in these more academic context, contexts and, uh, and, and use our knowledge and use your artworks and your practices to actually affect change for the oceans? Um, so I, I think that that's an excellent, excellent next step question. Um, one of the things that uh, I've experienced is um, um, the violence that we uh, we see being applied to to not only to our ecology but to people of color, and we're seeing this particularly expressed in the United States right now, and picked up and reflected uh, across the world in public protests. Uh, the violence against the other uh, comes from this false sense of separation from the other, where we can demonize the other, we can minimize who they are. It allows us to do these violent things towards people as well as towards the earth itself. Uh, my effort is um, uh, based on, a, on an action in 1985 where my community stood up and blockaded logging interests here in British Columbia owned by extremely uh, important and influential government and, and uh, people. And we were 
arrested and we were charged with contempt of court, which is a very serious crime in, in, in British law. We were uh, found guilty of contempt of court and immediately pardoned. And the reason for that was the overwhelming public support by non-Indigenous people, particularly, who saw us for, maybe for the first time as real people. So the part of the process that I'm engaged in is how do I take this cultural uh, material, this this intellectual, uh, this this view, this cosmology, this Haida, this indigenous cosmology, and present it in such a way that people who see us in false ways, in imaginary ways, see us differently and see us as human. And if they see us as human, how can the how 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 can we? Uh, how could they perpetuate the violence? So it's about understanding and relationships between the other. And so we use the oceans and our, our sense of the world around us as a, as a way to, to express a, a different type of emotional relationship than one of, of, of uh, assaultive appetite, which is driving us towards extinction. And the, the time is now for us, all of us, to, to find ways to, to bridge those connections and dramatically change those relationships. Otherwise, we're all going to perish. So I think it's a great time. It's, it's not a death sentence, it's a challenge. If we do nothing, it's a death sentence. If we become integrated in the conversation and change a relationship, it, becomes a success, it can become a successful test for us all. But it is a test nevertheless. That's a great question, thank you so much. I'd just like to, to add um, um, onto what uh, Michael has, has, has said and to say that through the work that, that, Sorry. that, through, through the work that, that I'm doing, um, I'm hoping to also share the, the voices of, of those that, 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 that I encounter who would ordinarily not have any voice in, in policy making circles. So it, it's quite interesting how the, 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 the poetry is, is a way of cutting through the, the academies uh, and allowing, you know, voices to come through freshly and rawly. Um, and so I often weave, you know, into the poetry actual, actual words and phrases um, that people have shared with me um, in conversations that I've had with them. And I feel that the poetry can appeal to, um, to the emotions or the sentiments of people who are in power who have the ability to really to change things fundamentally, in other words, to, uh, uh, to appeal to their, their, their sense of um, community uh, beyond you know, their, their own sort of disciplinary boundary. And uh, it also, I feel, um, it speaks to the people who I have engaged with. In other words, it's not, it is not a genre of writing that is so far removed um, from one's daily experience that uh, you know, you, you, you can't experience it and you can't engage with it. And I think some people that have read and have heard my poetry have indicated that it, it is powerful in that sense because it, it really does viscerally uh, express the emotions that, that are, are at play. Thank, thank you very much for, for that, Rose. I think if everyone's willing, we, we'll, 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 we'll just run over slightly and take a, another question. The responses have been so good and, and the, the uh, chat in the sidebar has been so good. If everyone's happy, we'll just run over for a couple more minutes uh, with another question, Lisa. Sure. It's fabulous. Questions are coming in. Uh, I've got a question here from Vicky, um, who says, sharing cultural treasures with those external to your own community can be an incredible and beautiful act of trust and openness. It can also create deeper understanding between people. However, it also comes with risk. Given the history of appropriation and at times devastating harm, what measures can be taken or have been taken to try and help prevent this from occurring? And I guess, you know, if you'd like to maybe speak to some of your own personal experiences of that. I'm a, I'm a kind of, I'm an all or nothing person. I'm either going to give it all away or I'm going to say no. I'm not going to like measure it. I'm not going to like give 72.5% of my culture and you can appropriate that. I don't, you know, I'm just over that, man. It's either yes or no. Same as like I'm trying to say in, in my in my present dialogue uh, uh, through my work, I'm saying to myself first and then anyone who cares to listen that we're living in a plastic world and I'm going to tell the truth. I'm going to tell the truth about it. 
If I, if it means I, I, I can't even pick up a piece of jade or, or bone or stone or, or whale's tooth ever again, well, so be it. I'll, I'll devote my life to carving those plastic bottles, whatever it takes to tell my truth. Because we are here supposed to be here in the honesty business, guys. We're supposed to be here reflecting truth, reflecting whatever, whatever truth it is, but reflecting it honestly. You know, we can't be using our culture to hide behind or prop us up. Mm. Uh, oh, the ancestors don't want to hear that. They, wanna, they, wanna, they don't want us to be a Xerox photocopying machines of them. They've already done it better than us. They want to see something new. They want us to, they want to be challenged. They, I, I, the, half the time I get by in this world is because the, I, I amuse the gods. They, they are, I keep them on their toes. They're curious about what I'm going to do next. And because I've got that over them, they favor me. They favor me. Because we've got this, this one thing that the gods hate more than anything in this world, and that is they hate being bored. It drives them nuts. It makes them so angry. And, and because when they get bored, they make chaos with us. Because we're not supposed to be boring. We're supposed to, like, we're supposed to charge this thing, man. We're, they, they envy us so much, the gods. They have so much envy for us because we've got a gift. We've got a treasure. And we've got the treasure of mortality. We've got that treasure. That's a treasure, man, that we die. That we, that, we can, that we can be in this world as if it's the first and the last moment on earth. And that creates a quality, man. That creates a certain quality of living that the gods don't have. The gods are stuck like in lockdown. It's the same stuff day in and day out for eternity. So, so if we're going to talk about uh, our art, we're going to talk about the ocean, we're going to talk about being effective, or we're going to talk about... Uh, our, our, reflecting our own personal honesties, uh, everybody. Uh, thank you. Mm. Thank, thanks for that insight, George. It's amazing. Uh, I, so I think, Ronnie, uh, would you like to add to that? And... Yes, yeah, so thank you um, for the question. And from our cultural practice, there are significance of things that like one cannot do outside. Um, this the space where it's sacred and so ceremonies and rituals are very 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 important and those practice practices is where uh the what can be say as men, uh, men's business or women's business and that is that is cannot be appropriated in that sense and and we treasure that and that's really identify who we are. And those sounds that we play, some of those sounds cannot be played in public, cannot be publicly and be entertained in that sense. It has to be played within that space. Whoever wants to land that sound will have to go through their protocols to be able to really get that and just play there and then walk out. It's like entering a parliament house or a UN building. You have to go through the protocols and then walk out and that's it. So it's that, yeah. Uh, for us, that is the, in terms of cultural and making sure that the protocols, and this also ties into the first question, when that relationship building and understanding where the people of that place practice, the sustainable practice of the, ocean, the land, and when it's used mis or misappropriately, then we see the challenges that comes with that. And so it's, it's also about time to listen to those who have lived in those places and have practiced um, that relationship building with the land, the ocean, for many, many years. So it's also good to listen to those people. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Ronnie. Thank you very much. And I, I have to say, it's with a, it's with a really kind of heavy heart. I'm going to have to, to, to draw this to a close. It's been a, it's been a really, eye-opening and inspiring event, and I've learned a huge amount. And it's made, it's made me think, uh, uh, lots of really interesting thoughts about potential uh, future collaboration and, and, and work, hopefully working together with you guys. I've been really inspired by that. I just want to reiterate to. The, uh, the people who are still with us, there's still a large audience, that actually the, the recording of this will be available uh, from the One Ocean Hub website 
uh, in the next few days as well. So there's a little bit of editing required, and then it's going to go up. So we'll get we'll all get a chance to to revisit these presentations and 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 think more about it. And and we will also all get the chance to add uh, 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 additional questions. And I'm, I'm really sorry to those people who put their questions in the Q and A box. Uh, that, that we've run out of time. It was kind of predictable with such an amazing group of people uh, with such an amazingly diverse and exciting uh, worldviews and, wor and work, incredible work. It was kind of predictable that we were going to run out of time on this. So I, I'd just like to take the opportunity uh, uh, once again to publicly thank George, Ronnie, Michael and Rose. It's been really, really appreciated for you guys to give up your time. And I hope you found it useful as well, you know, to, to hear uh, uh, the work of other people. It's been fantastic from our perspective. So uh, I, I'll be in contact with you all again privately to, to reiterate this, but it's been a really fantastic uh, event. And I hope uh, it has been, just looking at the, 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 the stuff that's been going on in the chat privately, uh, I think everybody has got a lot out of this. Uh, and it's certainly the kind of thing that we can revisit in the future. So thank you all very much and enjoy the rest. Well, I was going to say enjoy the rest of your day, but Ronnie, I think maybe time to go to bed in, in Canberra. Everybody else, thank you very much indeed and enjoy the rest of your, uh, your day. Thank you all. Goodbye now. Goodbye, everyone. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye.